Hi everyone, thanks for joining us and welcome to the last science roundup of 2014. This week news came down that the National Institutes of Health is shutting down what is was known as the National Children's Study. Launched in 2005 with recruitment starting in 2009, this study was supposed to recruit 100,000 women who were either trying to become pregnant or already pregnant and track their child's development to age 18. This was really an unprecedented research opportunity for a number of health outcomes. Think about it. What would happen if you were to closely look at 100,000 pregnancies from right after conception, collect every biosample available, gain access to every medical record, and carefully follow the children to adulthood? This was the intention, but obviously it wasn't totally realistic. You get the idea, though. Risk factors and protective factors could have been examined in a way that smaller studies are only trying to do. It wasn't going to be cheap. It was going to be $2.8 billion. It wasn't going to be easy either. The National Children's Study had an entire staff to manage the whole thing and years of planning and input from different scientists. And it wasn't going to be quick. 25 years plus not counting all the time to plan it. So at a time when budgeting for services for individuals with disabilities, education, Medicare, and Social Security benefits were scarce, and available funding for programs were being slashed, it seemed like somewhat of a luxury and a non-essential use of money, and it was a pretty controversial venture. On the other hand, this was a study like no other, designed to answer questions around environmental influences of development that were totally impossible using existing research designs. It was supposed to inform a number of outcomes, including autism. It was important to many fields of science, psychology, epidemiology, public health, and toxicology. This had never been done in the U.S., and even in other countries, it hadn't been done like the NCS was proposing to do it. The March of Dimes wrote some recommendations to improve the way birth defects were studied in the National Children's Study. When I was at Autism Speaks, we convened a group of experts to make recommendations about how to use the National Children's Study not only to better answer the causes of ASD, but to also use the study to refine how autism was diagnosed and identified in community settings. For example, the group suggested that special attention be paid to the second trimester of pregnancy, where many scientists are focusing on that as a critical time. The group recommended not only that the MCHAT be used to identify potential autism cases, but that those cases get a full diagnostic evaluation, including not just a categorical diagnosis, but another evaluation to look at specific signs and symptoms. The sites could be trained to deliver these diagnoses, increasing the number of qualified people working with families with autism. There were other really valuable recommendations that, while targeted at the NCS, apply to other research as well. If you want to see them, they are posted on the Autism Speaks website, or if you're interested, they're also in the down bar of the YouTube link to this podcast. Then, a few years after the study launched, a new director was put in charge and told to cut costs. The way individuals were recruited into the study was changed from general recruitment, like the census does, and more from large managed HMOs. While the goals of the study did not change, what could actually be done was cut back. There was concern in the scientific community that the study was being cut back too much and the changes didn't make much sense. A few years ago, in, a better, in an effort to better support the research design, the NCS offered what were called formative research grants, which were designed to provide preliminary data that would be helpful to the protocol. One of these grants was led by Craig Neuschaefer at Drexel, and it examined how autism diagnosis could be streamlined in the context of the protocol. This has huge implications for other projects. If we can streamline diagnosis in the National Children's Study, can we streamline it in other research studies, clinical settings, and in the community? So recently, the Institute of Medicine looked carefully at the protocol and spoke with several experts about what needed to be done versus what was going to be done and what things were going to cost. So earlier this week, based on their input and because of all the issues raised, the NIH decided to pull the plug. This is really disappointing. The study had enormous potential, as I've just described. The research community saw it coming, but this is a potential blow for autism research. We'll wait to hear about what will happen to the participants already enrolled, their data, and the data that came out of these formative research projects. Then, a few years after the study launched, a new director was put in charge and told to cut costs. The way individuals were recruited into the study was changed from general recruitment, like the census does, and more from large managed HMOs. 
while the goals of the study did not change, what could actually be done was cut back. There was concern in the scientific community that the study was being cut back too much and the changes didn't make much sense. A few years ago, in, a better, in an effort to better support the research design, the NCS offered what were called formative research grants, which were designed to provide preliminary data that would be helpful to the protocol. One of these grants was led by Craig Neuschaefer at Drexel, and it examined how autism diagnosis could be streamlined in the context of the protocol. This has huge implications for other projects. If we can streamline diagnosis in the National Children's Study, can we streamline it in other research studies, clinical settings, and in the community? So recently, the Institute of Medicine looked carefully at the protocol and spoke with several experts about what needed to be done versus what was going to be done and what things were going to cost. So earlier this week, based on their input and because of all the issues raised, the NIH decided to pull the plug. This is really disappointing. The study had enormous potential, as I've just described. The research community saw it coming, but this is a potential blow for autism research. We'll wait to hear about what will happen to the participants already enrolled, their data, and the data that came out of these formative research projects. Another interesting study that came out this week looked at people with a specific mutation on chromosome 16. This area of chromosome 16, called 16P, is an autism risk gene, and the goal was to understand what people, what people with this mutation look like, not just limited to an autism diagnosis. The Simons Foundation had launched an initiative a few years ago to specifically recruit people with this mutation, and they called it VIP. They were able to identify 16 people, and they closely examined them and their entire families around measures of social reciprocity, verbal and nonverbal IQ, cognitive ability, and motor ability. These are heritable traits, and the way parents perform sometimes predict how children perform. But in order to see what happens in families with a genetic mutation, you have to study people with a genetic mutation. So what they found is that people with these mutations perform significantly worse on measures of social reciprocity and IQ. But not everybody scored the same. There was variability. So in order to see what was going on with the rest of the family, even those without a mutation, they looked at the scores of the parents. They found that the way people with 16P mutations scored on IQ and social reciprocity was related to how their parents performed. These traits are heritable. The parents were slightly impaired without having a gen genetic mutation with, and without having any sort of clinical diagnoses. What was interesting is they looked at quantitative measures, meaning s number scores that you can score along a spectrum, versus qualitative. Qualitative means autism yes or autism no. They found that because these diagnostic thresholds are not met does not mean that someone is not affected or that a mutation confers no effect. So looking at some of these behavioral characteristics in families may be helpful in predicting abilities of their child. I say this, but this is still an ongoing and somewhat controversial area of research and part of the reason why family participation in research is so important. So finally, on Monday and Tuesday of this week, I was in Stony Brook, New York for a meeting called Conversations on Autism and Sign Language, which brought together about 20 researchers in autism, linguistics, humanities, and individuals and scholars who were either deaf or had autism, family members of deaf people or people with autism. When I first heard about this meeting, I really thought it was going to be about teaching nonverbal people to use sign language, but it really ended up having nothing to do with that. The goal to here was to learn more about other ways that people with autism could communicate other than just through the spoken word. We learned from the history of sign language how nonverbal communication was developed and used. While sometimes in our society communication and sociability can be overemphasized, there are times when people without language are desperate to communicate. So what measures can we use to identify nonverbal or non-speech communications such as hand flapping or hand leading? Are these communications? And what can we learn about them? Do families with a nonverbal individual have their own methods of communication and do they in fact sign? What does this tell us about the abilities rather than the disabilities of people on the spectrum? Do people with autism have their own language, so to speak? And if so, what is it? Does it actually even require an intervention? The goal of the meeting was not to come up with a solution, but to begin a conversation. 
I was really honored to be part of such a rich discussion, and ASF will be part of ongoing discussions in the future. The topic is really important not only for how basic understanding of how people with autism communicate, but to think about how we can improve communication, not just verbally, but non-verbally. Instead of treating the person with autism, some of the discussion touched on ways to change the environment to accommodate people with autism. ASF wishes everyone a happy holiday season. As I mentioned, there will be no science roundup for the next two weeks, but as always, we will update you on the ASF website about new findings. Also, remember to make sure we can keep doing these science podcasts by visiting recipeforhope.org and donating to the Autism Science Foundation. Happy holidays and talk to you all next year.